This is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast and this week I do want to talk about my new SX64 uh, and how I brought it fully back to life. But I need to start the episode with some sad news. Uh, Burton Hagelin, or James Hagelin as he was known, uh, he was the creator and admin of Commodore Computer Central Facebook group, which I'm sure many of you were members of or at least heard of. Um, he died in a tragic house fire on January 19th, very sudden, and he was 51 years old and he was known to a lot of Commodore users uh, as an avid collector and refurbisher of 8-bit Commodore equipment. Um, many people, they bought or sold things from him or, or worked with him over the years and refurbishing their own equipment and uh, from everything I've read, nice guy, kind guy, thoughtful guy, always thinking about other people and uh, I didn't know him personally, I just knew him through his posts on Facebook, but I was touched when I heard that he passed. Um, I want to put a big thank you out for Gregory J. Smith for taking the lead in gathering all the information about what happened to James and putting it on Facebook, and also for um, creating a new group to, uh, to remember him. And I'll put the information about the new Facebook group down here and in the description too. Um, my heart goes out to, to his family. I'm sorry that, it, that, that, that this happened. And uh, if you can, log on to his obituary page. And again, I'll put the link in the description. I'll put it down here. Just leave a little note if you know who knew him or did business with him. Just, just so his family knows that the Commodore community, you know, is thinking about it. Now, on to happier news. I found an SX64 the other week. Um, for a really fair price. I was, it was a really reasonable price. Um, Mi Amigo is the username of the gentleman I bought it from. His name is Curtis. He's on Amiga.org. I'll put a link to him and his information down here. Um, he was selling, or is selling, a fair amount of Commodore equipment, both 8-bit uh, Commodore equipment and a lot of Amiga equipment, too. Uh, really fair prices and discounting everything by 50% off what he was originally uh, selling it for. He wants to move the equipment. Um, so I talked to him a little bit over email. Fantastic salt of the earth guy. Really a nice guy. He's out of uh, Illinois. Um, and I highly recommend checking out his for sale thread. He, last I checked the other day, he still had a bunch of stuff on there. Uh, but once you guys take a look at it, it'll be gone quickly because it's some good stuff at good prices. And uh, as a perk, as a bonus, he uh, sent to me links for the complete run of Compute and computes gazette and the computes gazette disc and it is totally awesome i just love it uh, so i've been looking through some of the old magazines i'm going to make some of the the d64 files into real discs and play with them on, on, on my machine uh, so yeah thanks curtis i appreciate it everything's great um, now on to the sx64 i've never really been in the market for an sx64 uh, you know, I've known about them since I was a kid, since 84 when they came out, of course, I knew about them, but could never afford it back then. And I've worked on a couple of them over the years, you know, uh, friends, relatives, customers who've had SX64s back 20, 25 years ago. I've uh, done some work on them, loved them, fantastic machines, just never needed one. Um, but I'm glad I took the chance and tried this one out. Uh, they're really awesome. They're really cool. Uh, now, the SX64 was marketed by Commodore as a business computer, you know, a Commodore business machines, so they wanted to get back into the business market. Uh, they they were already completely dominating the home market with their C64. Um, and they made a bit of headway with this machine in the education market, too. I know some schools used them. Um, they were never a huge hit. Now, exact sales numbers aren't really available. But from what I've been able to gather, it looks like somewhere between like 50,000 or maybe 70,000 of them were produced. Uh, and they're still actually fairly available today. You can usually find one or two on eBay pop up every couple of months. Now, internally, the SX64, it's a fully functional Commodore 64 with an integrated uh, five inch display and an integrated 1541 disk drive. Um, let me show you a little bit about it. Now, on the front, you'll notice it has a nice 5-inch display that actually looks pretty darn good. 
Uh, the camera is washing it out a little bit, but the colors are bright. It's actually really, really readable from a couple of feet away. So I don't have any issues with the display. Comes with an integrated five and a quarter inch 1541 drive. Works exactly like a 1541 should. It's, it's hard set to device eight, but it is possible just like a 1541 to change it to nine, 10, or 11, but you have to go in and cut some traces and solder some traces. It's got this little cool little storage bay here that's designed to hold discs. I'm going to be doing a video on this one. It's a very special version of Gauntlet. It's got a little magic door here. And inside the magic door, you've got brightness control, tint control, um, a reset button for the floppy drive. It resets the drive in case it gets bungled up. Um, so you have some nice controls in there and volume, I think I mentioned. Uh, the keyboard is unique in that it actually snaps right on the front. So there, snaps right on the front. And then this handle pulls out. You just release some little tabs and this handle pulls out and you can carry the little guy around. Do this with one hand here. I'll talk a little more about the keyboard in a minute. Now, you see it has a standard cartridge slot here. I've got an Epix Fast Load Reloaded in here from the future was 8-bit. Please shop at his website. They're great guys. Let's turn this little guy around. On the back, you've got two standard joystick ports. That's Joy 1 and that's Joy 2, so it's kind of backwards from where you'd think. Uh, it has a standard video port. I actually have this hooked up via S-Video to my television in my office here. It has a standard serial port for connecting disk drives and printers to. A standard user port here for connecting modems to. There's your power and there's a power switch. Now, one thing you may notice is it does not have a data set port and that is absolutely accurate. Um, no particular point in putting a data set on this little guy. Now I miss it because my SD to IEC uses the data set port for power. So I currently, unless I get a different power source, can't use it very conveniently on this, but that's okay. I use my Pi 1541 on here. No problem at all. The other thing that it's missing is a um, RF modulator. There's no RF modulator on the little guy. Let's spin it back around. Now, this little guy has a built-in speaker, which I'll be talking to you more about in a minute. Uh, it did not function when I got it, but it works great now. And let's give the little speaker a little listen to here. So, nothing to write home about, but absolutely passable. I'm actually playing Miss Pac-Man with one finger and holding the camera here. So the speaker is perfectly passable, perfectly usable. Uh, you can imagine all of the Commodore SX-64's competitors back in 1984, uh, the portable computers. You'd be lucky if they had a little PC speaker that went blink, boop, beep in there. And this one has a full SID chip with full beautiful uh, synthesized sound on it. Just incredible for the day. The keyboard itself is fully detachable. It has a 25 pin uh, connector there and a 25 pin that plugs into the bottom of the unit. And it's designed where you unplug both of them, wrap the cable up and sort, store it in the storage bay when it's not in use. Now, obviously this is not an original cable. This is the one that Curtis sent me. The original is probably long gone. Um, it is not pretty, but it's absolutely functional. Now, if you do have to replace your own cable for the keyboard, you can make your own like, like this one with just a 25 pin parallel type, mail to mail with a ribbon there. That's just straight through connection. Or there's a gentleman by the name of uh, Elia Valerio on the SX64 group on Facebook. And he makes and sells new cables that look almost identical to the original SX64 cable. I'll put a link to uh, his profile there if you want to send him a message. 
if you have an SX64 and you need a replacement cable. He also does keyboard repairs um, if you don't want to tackle it yourself. Now that's something I'm doing in this video. Now, when I received the SX64, it was not in perfect working condition, but nor was it promised to be in perfect working condition. There were three things that were very, very wrong with it when I got it. Uh, number one was the keyboard was absolutely shot. I'd plug it in, it would boot up to the regular C64 screen, and you would literally have to bang, bang, bang on a key to get it to respond. It would eventually respond, but you can imagine if you have to type load, quote, star, comma, eight, comma, one, or whatever, you're bang, bang, bang on the L until it showed up, bang, bang, bang on the O until it showed up, and you know, you just can't do that. That's, that's nuts. It's gonna bust your keyboard. Uh, about three-fourths of the keys were like that. There were actually a couple keys that worked normally. Now, so that was my first clue, that it was a keyboard issue and not like a burned out CIA chip or something like that, because the keys would eventually work. Did some research online. People have had this problem traditionally with the SX64 after years and years of sitting around. And the fix, while it's not easy, it's also not difficult if you're careful. And I'm gonna go through that step by step. Second thing was the speaker was completely dead. Uh, I couldn't use the keyboard, I couldn't use the disk drive, which I'll explain, but I put my Gorf cartridge in here. I heard nothing from the speaker. Crank it up full blast, not even a bleh, just nothing. But I hooked it up with my composite cable to my TV. Audio was absolutely perfect. So I knew the SID chip was in great shape. I wasn't worried about the SID chip. I knew it was just the speaker that was blown. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, the third thing, and a critical one, is the disk drive was completely shot. You'd go to load anything, and it would spin the disk for a few seconds, and then file not found. I don't care what disk you threw at it, file not found. Nothing worked. So, But it was recognizing the device, and it was trying to spin it up, so I knew it was ultimately repairable. So now it's time to dig in and repair this little beauty. So I got it in, seems to be in fine shape. <clears throat> so I powered the little guy on and the disk drive starts whirring. And before you know it, we've got a nice little screen up here. So that's great. Screen works great, it's responsive. Uh, three issues that I found with it so far. First one is the keyboard. Some keys, like the enter key, first one is things like the enter key and a couple of the other keys work okay, so I know it's communicating, but other keys, like uh, most others, work, either don't work or require a lot of physical force on the keyboard before the keystroke appears. Now, I've done a lot of research, and I do know that there's a way to, to fix that that involves opening this up, cleaning off the, the membrane, cleaning the keyboard, and then, uh, using a little bit of uh, graphite to kind of fix the conductivity issues that are in here. So I'll, I'll do that in this video. Issue number two is the disk drive. Uh, we can do a reset on the drive with a little button. It obviously sees the drive. Uh, we'll use the Commodore Run Stop key. Uh, one cool feature of these is that they've redone in the kernel the Commodore Run Stop key instead of trying to load from tape it tries to load it from disk, which is kind of a cool thing. So we have to hit it kind of hard to initiate that. There we go. It's obviously trying to read the disk and it gives up. Now, probably this is just dirty heads. Take the guy apart, clean the heads. We'll probably be working again because it is obviously spinning the disk. You see Gorf comes up without any issue at all and we get absolutely no audio out of the system, out of the speaker. Uh, so no matter what I do with the, the volume control knob, I don't even get a buzz or a hum out of the built-in speaker. Now, my first thought, of course, was, you know, well, maybe we have a bad SID chip in here, but I've taken that out of the equation, just like this. What I did then is I just hooked it up to my regular television with uh, the composite cable. Audio works fine, so the SID chip is just fine. So it's probably just a bad speaker, a bad connection internally. 
Looks like we've got a couple of screws we need to release. Uh, I've got some here and some there, so let's get those undone. And this, I believe, is a dual membrane keyboard, kind of like on the older style of the Amiga 500. And those are always a bit more of a pain to work with. Now, some people have had really good luck just cleaning their membranes and their SX64 keyboards come back to life. And some people have to use a special kind of graphite paint to kind of uh, touch up some of the, the contacts. Now, I did get some of the graphite paint. This is a keypad fix, but I've read that it does a fairly good job. It is a graphite based. Um, so we're gonna see how it works, if I even need it. Out comes the keyboard. And there's our little keyboard connector there. And uh, that's held on with a couple of Phillips head screws. So let's take that off too, so we have more flexibility getting to the keys. And out she comes, and out come the screws. So our keyboard is now free from our case. Now if you look on the bottom here, it looks like all of the keys do need to be removed in order to access any of the membrane. Bummer. Each of these has a little clip that needs to be released in order to release the key. Uh, and then the space bar has two little uh, clips there and then two little clips there to release it. I will not bore you with me taking all of the keys off of this, but I am going to take a picture of it with my cell phone so I have some idea of where the keys go when I put them back. Uh, not like I just couldn't look on my C64 keyboard and make sure, but this seems like a smart thing to do. Now, I'm not sure quite why this is the case, but I'm having better luck going from the bottom of the key releasing that clip and then replacing re releasing the top one so if you see there's a clip here and a clip there for that key so just putting a little pressure releasing the bottom and then releasing the top seems easier than releasing the top and then the bottom who knows why but it's working for me now when the final keys are all removed you're going to have this side and that side, and you're gonna have two little screws there that hold everything together there. So we're gonna to wanna to release those screws, and then hopefully we can get this keyboard apart. They're very tiny, so don't lose them. I'm gonna put them in the actual keyboard container so they don't slip away. Now let's see what we've got here. Okay. Now this membrane, I have to be very, very gentle getting that up because it feels like it is made from flimsy paper. Now this entire backside is carbon too. So again, what I did is I took a little bit of this carbon paint here and on the edge of a Q-tip, I just lightly touched up each of these little contacts here with some carbon paint. Then I tested it with a continuity tester and I got good results. So we're getting continuity, but the backside, all of this is also uh, conductive, which is very interesting. 
So just literally anywhere I go, the whole back panel is conductive too. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean this back up here too and see if I can find any areas on here where the keys actually hit that look like they're they're faded. Maybe some of the, the conductive materials weren't off and I'm going to touch those up again with a Q-tip and just a little bit of the carbon paint, just a light layer, not a lot at all. So this may be a little bit difficult to see, but on here you can see the faint impressions of some of the keys uh, as they type, like maybe they're, eh, it's so hard to see with this, but um, you can see where it's maybe just rubbed just a little bit of the uh, carbon coating off of here, and so it's just not making perfect contact, which is why you gotta bang it pretty hard. So this is where I'm gonna touch it up between where the keys actually press. I'm just gonna touch that a little bit up with a little bit of paint. And when I say a little, I mean just a little. We don't want to glom it on there because that's going to reduce the conductivity. But just get a little bit of paint on there and uh, just find those areas. Like here. I'm going to touch that up just a little bit. I'm going to do that for the rest of the keyboard here. Now, of course, comes the fun part of replacing all of the keys. Now, luckily, I did take a picture, so I'll be able to reference that, make sure they all go where they're supposed to go. I think I will begin with what is simple and proceed to what is difficult. keys should just snap right into place. For example, there's the F7 and the F8 key. Make sure our membrane is lined up. And they just snap right into place. Nothing to it. The inside of the SX64 is really quite attractive. Uh, this back plane here holds the main processor, the 6510, same as the Commodore 64, and the VIC chip, and, and all the, the other chips that are necessary. Uh, these two chips here, one of them's the SID, and one of them's a PLA chip, they tend to get very hot. So you see, I put some nice heat sinks on there with some adhesive backing that will keep those nice and cool. If this chip here ever loses its big old honking heat sink, that's the VIC-2 chip under there, uh, that thing overheats right away. So you always want to make sure that's on there good and snug. Um, this is the line that runs to the built-in uh, display. So that handles your video. There's our cartridge slot. Uh, disc controller here. And uh, this uh, links up with the cartridge controller right here. Now. This thing would not read floppies at all. It would spin the disk and file not found. Um, I tried it first without complete disassembly to clean it and I got it so it sort of occasionally maybe read a, dir a directory but it was never reliable. Never could load a program. So I had to take everything apart and in addition to cleaning the head which is of course right under there uh, with isopropyl alcohol I also lubricated the rails because they were fairly sticky and lubricated this little guy here. This is uh, involved in the, the tension on the, um, the stepper motor for the head. The stepper motor is underneath here. Um, I also popped off this little C-clip and this washer, but be very careful when you do it because this thing could fly across a room and then you got to track down another C-clip. Uh, and lubricated under there because we'd get a lot of squeaking whenever it did try and read the drive. Now, the the other thing that was happening with this is it would not eject floppy disks. You'd put a floppy in and it would just kind of get stuck in there and I'd have to reach in to pull it out. If you see that little lever being uh, manipulated there, that's what actually springs the floppy out it's after, you, after you release it. So you lock it down and then, and it flops out. Uh, this was stuck 
way over here on this side behind this piece so it could never pop the disc open. So it would never eject the disc. Once I did that, fixed that, lubricated and cleaned everything, this thing has been reading directories flawlessly. So I'm very, very happy with that. Um, the, the one disadvantage is you have to take everything out of the machine to get to it. You have to undo the monitor because our little storage tray here for, for floppy disks or whatever is generally screwed in over here and you can't get a screwdriver in there to unscrew it. So what I'm going to do when I put this thing back, I'm not going to uh, uh, put those screws back in. I mean, for transportation, I'd probably put it in again. But if it's just going to be sitting on my desk doing work, I'm not going to put this screw and this screw back in. So if I need to get down to the flop again in the future, I can just pop out these little, uh, the little tabs in the side, get the the storage tray out and get to the floppy without having to take out, say, the power supply, which you have to loosen up, this card, which you have to loosen up, this card, which you have to loosen up in order to get the storage tray out. I'm just going to make it easier on myself for future modifications. Uh, really a beautifully designed system. I'm really quite happy with, with what Commodore did to uh, make it work. Now I wanted to emphasize a few things about the keyboard cleaning that may not have been apparent in the cleaning portion of the video. To open up the keyboard, you've got these little slots here. And there's here, here, and here. They're just little plastic tabs that hold it in place. Just push like a little screwdriver in there and it puts pressure on the tab and releases it. But be careful, because these are 35-year-old keyboards and the plastic ain't what it used to be. So we open them up carefully, just a little bit of, tiny, tiny bit of pressure in there to release the tabs. And then the top comes off. Set that somewhere safe. Over here, this is something we need to really be worried about. This is a metal plate, and you'll see the screws on the bottom of it in the, the, in the earlier part of the video that you have to unscrew and remove this metal plate. This metal plate is key, and it puts pressure on the actual physical contacts between the two membranes, and the carbon, the graphite, whatever that is, uh, that, that creates the conductivity actually tore up a little bit on mine and it actually just peeled off. So I had to repaint those and you'll see a little bit about that in the video, or you saw a little about that in the video. Now, I had an issue, like I said, with this, this tab here and underneath it, you'll see some lines that, that connect the bottom and the top portion of the membrane. Mine was in bad shape. So even after I cleaned everything up and put this back on, some keys still just didn't respond the way I wanted to. They were a little hesitant or I had to, you know, you, you had to hit them a few times before they responded. But then I noticed if I put some pressure on this tab here with my finger and typed, everything was perfect. So I knew that there, there was some loss of, of conductivity here. It just wasn't making a good connection. So I used a roll of my double-sided tape that I use to put on heat sinks. It's got uh, plastic on one side that you can peel off to make it double-sided. I left that plastic on. I put a strip of that material on here. It's a very thin material and I left the plastic coating on here and then put the metal bar back on and that extra little material was just enough to push hard enough on the little bar to make the conductivity perfect. Didn't have any issues after that, so do that. When you put the keys back on here, they go on super easy. Of course, take a picture before you take the keys off so you, you know where they go. It's more helpful than you think because you're looking at it like, uh, where's the H go? Where's the J go? So just take a picture. Uh, but there's little tiny springs on the bottom of each of these keys that you probably saw in the earlier part of the video. They can, in theory, fall out. They're in there pretty good. They're kind of twisted in there. So you, you know, But if one falls out, that key won't work. Uh, I had that problem with the S key and the Enter key. They, neither of them would respond. What's going on? I looked. The springs were gone. 
One of them was lying on my desk. The other one was on the floor. I'm thankful I found them or I would have been hosed and I would have had to steal a another spring for another unused key until I found another spring of the right size. It really needs that spring to make the, the, the connection, the conductivity. It will not work without the spring. The other thing about the keyboard I recommend is test it before you put it all back together. If you clean it, you put the paint on there and you get everything buttoned back up, you boot it up and a third of the keys don't work, you gotta undo everything again. So just test it with the keyboard in its disassembled state. You can plug the cable right in and your finger is a good enough conductor. You can actually hit the places where the keys would normally hit and it'll conduct it and actually send a signal to the computer. You can make sure it's gonna work. Uh, now I did not do that completely. I put the keys back on before I did that and realized that uh, one of the keys was not working and it turns out I had forgotten to put a little bit of the graphite uh, paint on one of the little pads, one of the graphite pads, and it wasn't responding. So I had to take a third of the keys off so I could peel it off back just enough, repaint it, let it dry, put it back down, presto, it works. So just do yourself a favor, test it before you get everything put back together. Now the other thing that I did mention in the previous part of the video, on the storage tray, I did not put the screws back in the sides. With those screws in, you're required to take out the entire CRT and remove the motherboard and move it out of the way a little bit before you can actually get to the disk drive. Without putting those retaining screws back in, it still has two plastic clips and then it sits down inside the unit here. You can see it's nice and sturdy. But if I open the top up, which takes like three or four minutes, I can just pop that storage tray out, I have full access to my drive. I don't have to disassemble the entire unit just to get to it now. So in my humble opinion, don't put those two screws back in on the side of the tray. It'll just make it more difficult to get to the drive if we ever need to get to it again in the future. What's my opinion of the SX64? What's my ultimate opinion? Now, it's a really a great device. It really is portable, even though it's 23 pounds, you know, just the fact that your monitor, your speakers, your keyboard and everything, you can lug around like a suitcase, it's kind of cool. You know, you go to a user's group meeting or something like that, taking along your SX64, not only is it gonna draw attention, but it's gonna be a lot easier than carrying around a big monitor. And even with a little screen, really, you can fit three or four people around it and play an, a, a game, a multiplayer game, you're fine, you're just fine. Things I would have loved in a perfect world to have on an SX64, is a reset switch for the, the 64 itself. The reset switch that's on there only resets the, the disk drive, which is really handy because there are times you need to reset that. But I just, you know, 35 year old machine, I just dread every time I have to power it down and power it back up because that's putting strain on that little CRT there that I'd rather not put on there. Now, everything's fine when I have my little uh, Epix fast load cartridge in here because it has a, a reset switch. Got it from the Futures 8-bit, order one. They're like 15 bucks, they're fantastic. And I, I strongly recommend it, not only because it speeds up the uh, access to anything on disk, but it has a reset button right on here that'll re do a soft reset of the machine. It's really handy. So this is going to be a replacement for my bread bin C64. Now, I, I love my bread bin just fine. I've talked about it a couple times on the show, uh, but I don't think I need it anymore. This is gonna be handy because when I do uh, a video capture, what I've had to do in the past is I hook up the machine to my video capture device that records right to my laptop, and then I can only see the screen on my laptop display itself. So I'm, you know, as I'm demoing a game or playing, I'm trying to look at my laptop screen uh, at the same time because that's what's recording. With this, I can use this to watch what's going on and then hook up my video cable to my capture device. No problem at all. I've got a screen to watch and it's capturing at the same time. So that's gonna be really convenient. And it seems to be fully compatible with anything. Besides the fact it can't handle a data set, there's nothing I've thrown at it that it has not handled. So would I recommend the SX64 if you have a chance to find one? Absolutely. Pick one of these up, they're really great. They're not that hard to fix once you're careful and, and you, you know what you're doing and they're, they're not that hard to repair and they're great little machines. Now, like I mentioned to my pal 
Intricate from AmigaLove.com. I'll put that right down here, AmigaLove.com. Uh, please go onto his website, sign up. It's a great, great resource. It's a great website to, to chat with people on. Uh, I am going to play some Ultima One on my SX64. This is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast signing out to go save Britannia. Where are we going? It's a bear! Attack the bear! <laughs> One silver. I'm rich.